it's an honor uh, to sit with you here. Thank you so much for uh, supporting with your presence the World Cleanup Day and the Still It World. So the theme of the conference, as you recently found out, is embodying unity. What does it mean in an um, awakening spiritual or also like mind exploring perspective? The idea of unity is, is the idea of connectedness, right? Okay that we are deeply connected with each other as human beings, but also you can expand that definition to we are deeply connected as societies across countries, across language barriers, across religious barriers, and ultimately we're deeply connected to our world, our planet, and to all life force on the planet. There's so, so much division between Let's, where do we start? Environmentalists and non-environmentalists. How to bring those people together? How to create this um, embodied unit? Well, I think one of the most important things is that the division is manufactured. Mm -hmm. We are actually way, way, way more connected than we think. The division is manufactured by the media and by politicians because division gets attention. Whenever you create hate, whenever you create fear, you get more eyeballs. And the algorithms mm -hmm. of the internet actually reward for eyeballs, they reward for attention. And when people talk about unity, well, it's, it's the truth. We know that in our soul, so we don't pay attention to it. But when they talk about how different we are, when we hate on other people, what happens is that you get the clicks. Mm. And so we've created this craziness in our society where we are rewarding attention to politicians who scream about us versus them. Mm and to media companies that pull us to the extreme left or the extreme right. But it's not real. I have a friend called Monty Moran. He was the former CEO of a famous restaurant chain called Chipotle. And after he resigned as CEO, he went in a project around America. He traveled around America to create videos on what the real America is like. And I was speaking to Monty recently and he said, you know, wherever he traveled, he never saw division. Whether you were right or you were left or you were black or you were white, Everyone in America was so loving and gentle and welcoming of each other. The division was only on the television screens. And the division was being amplified. And so we all think that separatism is real. But it's not. If you go out there and you talk to people, it's completely made up. But how do we uh, pop that bubble? How do we get out of that delusion? What news, are the tricks? News media have to be held accountable. In 1991, what happened is um, the uh, America got rid of something called the Objectivity in News mm. uh, Act. And what that meant is prior to, prior to the 1990s, in American media, you had to state both sides of the story. But Dick Cheney, there's a famous movie about this called Vice. Mm. Dick Cheney with Roger Ailes of Fox News axed that law. And all of a sudden, polarization media became a thing. Mm -hmm. And that has been really bad for the country. But now it's very hard to go back because companies like Fox generate 1.5 billion in profit every year. And they, it is in their incentive for these laws to be out there. But European countries should start enacting these laws mm -hmm. because Europe is going to fall prey to the same type of division in politics. What happened in the US could happen in Europe. It's so important that we have the right laws that promote objectivity in media. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we got to do is we have to train Europeans, as well as people all across the world, at a, at, a, at a school level to recognize this political trick. And the political trick is called us versus them. And many political parties play it. Trump used it, mm -hmm. Bolsonaro used it, mm -hmm. Ecre in Estonia mm -hmm. used it. And every time you vote for a politician who uses us versus them, even the, the architects of Brexit used it, you are voting for someone who's giving you a false narrative of reality. And these politicians, if you historically mm -hmm. look, almost all of them failed their countries. But uh, there is, yes, of course, there is politics and the rest of the people, but there is also organizations that actually have the same goal to, I don't know, make the planet greener, right. make it more sustainable. But they also have conflict between themselves. So what happens is when you have polarization in the media, what tends to happen is that many people go way extreme. You do not mm. want to go extreme. The, um, the, that movement of environmentalists that were gluing their hands and destroying artworks, that was mm. horrible. And that was really bad for true environmentalists because you make environmentalists look like unreasonable jerks. 
and you don't want to do that as well. You spoke in your presentation about um, how different cultures are, how differently they see the world. What are the tricks to bring those people together in a neutral and lovely basis? The, the, well, that's a very, very deep question, mm. right? But part of it is, would be teaching concepts like integral theory mm. at a schooling level, teaching concepts um, um, such as Darwin's diffusion of sympathy. These were ideas I shared in my yeah. talk at a schooling level. Once you educate the younger generation, they grow up in a world where it's just accepted that we are more unified. Recently, there was a study that said about 80% of big environmental leaders are in pre-suicidal state. Why is it so difficult to be an environmental leader in our society and universe at this point? You really want me to answer that? Yes, please. The truth. Yeah. How long do I have? <laughs> All the time we need. Okay. So I think many environmental leaders today are not doing a good job. So, and the reason is because they're failing to understand what is really going to fix the environment. And that is exponential technologies, as well as changing human concepts of how we see our relationship with the earth. So environmental leaders, firstly, as I was giving this talk over here, I, what I noticed is that people were not aware of exponential technologies. Hmm. There's a great book by Peter Diamandis called Bold. He talks about how exponential technologies are growing at such a great rate that we are going to solve our environmental crisis. There's nothing hmm. to be scared about. This does not mean that we stop teaching and preaching and raising awareness. That's super important. As we do that, we are sparking scientists and engineers to help build these technologies. Some of the technologies that are really, really exciting is, for example, drones that can be automatically programmed to plant trees and forest yes. the environment. Other technologies are the rise of electric vehicles. Others, um, low, low, rapidly dropping prices in solar power, which means clean energy, and then desalinization, which means easy access to water. When we have crazy amounts of power, crazy amounts of clean water. We can basically make places like the Middle East oasis. Mm. We can turn this into rich forests. We can create so much more, more places on earth where drones can plant trees mm. and we can create a, a much more tighter closeness to nature. Environmentalists I found as a rule, not only don't seem to understand how rapidly technology is progressing, but they vilify the people building these technologies. They vilify these people, mm -hmm. and they make ordinary people angry at the environmentalists. That movement of environmentalists destroying artworks, tossing sauce on the Mona Lisa, um, gluing themselves mm -hmm. to the ground, was disturbing and disgusting. And it makes people feel angry at environmentalists. They shouldn't be doing that. There's another movement from the extreme left where they blame and vilify rich people. Elon Musk used to be very left-leaning. Mm -hmm. Right now, he's completely on the right side. He literally on Twitter said, I encourage people to vote Republicans. I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. But if you look back at Elon's statement a few months before that, he said people on the left have become vicious. Mm -hmm. And he was unfairly attacked. This is a man mm -hmm. who has done so much to promote electric vehicles, so much to help save the planet so much, more than most environmentalists and perhaps all the environmentalists on the planet put together, mm -hmm. yet the left attacks him. And that's where environmentalists are not serving their own cause. They have turned Pull to... Pull yourself. Yeah. They've have, they have, they have become ultra mm -hmm. extreme. Mm -hmm. Stop hating rich people. Start catching up on the idea of exponential technologies. Yeah. Stop doing stupid stunts like gluing yourself to... to the walls of museums, start having dialogue. Stop blaming people who don't believe in global warming. I love when Michael got on the stage and he said that the people who don't believe in global warming is, are often the most people living the most sustainable lifestyles, yeah. growing their own food, living in farmland. Now, I believe in global warming, but you don't vilify people who don't believe in it. And you certainly don't vilify the engineers, the scientists, and the billionaires who are doing good things for the planet. I used to work for Bill Gates. 
I know I, I've, I've met Elon, but I know his mother very well because I did a documentary film about his mother. Mm -hmm. These are good people. We vilify them for stupid reasons. But they are people who are doing so much good to help the planet. They need to be our heroes. They do not need to be vilified. Mm -hmm. The environmental movement has to calm the heck down. That's a really interesting and important part of it, but there is also this personal aspect. You see, as an environmental organization leader, you, you're so into the problem that you see that the world is going to end. We run out of clean air, we run out of clean water, everything, and you just get depressed by the, by the vision that you have created to yourself. How right. do you deal with that? The world is not going to end. I have deep <laughs> faith in humanity. Look, remember the ozone hole? Yes. Right? Mm. The ozone hole has fixed itself, right? We, mm. we, we, made, we made changes. We started banning uh, um, chlorofluorocarbons. I don't know how to pronounce that right. <laughs> Different changes are going to happen. Yeah. There are so many funds right now mm. that are mm. being developed to fund clean tech companies. Mm -hmm. I was literally at the Estonian Startup Awards. It was so wonderful to see that one of the categories right now is like top clean tech company. I know members of the Estonian government and I know how much the Estonian government has set aside to invest in clean technology. Yes. I have friends who have set up clean technology funds. There is a huge rise right now in companies which are helping improve the earth. And among the engineers, among the scientists, we're not afraid of global warming. Mm -hmm. We, we're not disillusioned, we're not living in illusion as well. We know the numbers, we know it's gonna get bad, but we also understand that technology is growing at an exponential rate. The technology, okay, let me explain it this way. Between 1900 and 2000, the world saw a lot of change, but the world saw that same degree of change between 2000 and 2016. Indeed. In 16 years, we saw 100 years of change. Now it gets faster. Between 2016 and 2022, we saw those years of change in just, what is that, six years? And now between 2022 and 2030, we're gonna see the equivalent of over a century's worth of change. So the difference between 1900, we're talking World War I, and 2000, we're talking rise of the internet, we're gonna see between 2023 and 2030. This is why I'm bullish that we are going to be saving the planet and global warming is going to be reversed. Thank you so much for your time. This was a very interesting interview for this part.